possible trial revegetation of the State Highway Road Corridor with native vegetation. Well, that was done out at Wainui years ago, and it looks really lovely, but it would be great if someone went and removed the willow trees, and there's about three of them, that are growing in amongst the natives. You know, why, if they're going to be NZTA are going to have a role, then let them do the job properly and actually only have natives. And they didn't initiate that. I think the Wainui school initiated the planting. It looks really, really good, but it's got about three or four random uh, willow trees that should be removed. So can we... Perhaps I will raise that with NZTA next week. Yep. Raise it with uh, the regional transport. Mm. Sorry, you wish have been just the other thing I should have mentioned that just a reminder that these are activity reporting for that quarter up until March 31st, which is why the information Excluded. that's captured in there hasn't right. got. Yes, that will be captured in the next quarter. Councillor Watermont. Uh, thank you. Um, so first of all, I just want to say how excited I am to see uh, that table on one of these pages, which I've now lost. Um, on page 208, um, that's really fantastic news. Well done securing such an exciting thing for our rural communities to actually see lots of metal on the roads. Mm -hmm. um, I had, did have a question around the conversion of units so um, normally we'd place t between 20 and 25,000 tonnes per year, but the, uh, the table is in cubic metres. Do they roughly translate or not so much? Uh, through the chair, it is around 1.2 tonne per cubic metre is a good, good guide, so about a tonne, mm. depending on where we are and what we're, what we're hauling with those loads. So we've still got something in the region of an 80% um, increase over and above, or no, way more than that, like, 300% increase. This is a very big increase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no, well done on that. I'm absolutely <laughs> wrapped. Um, still, uh, the RFSs, um, the trend for them is, is also quite uh, alarming, I guess. I uh, just noticed that we had a huge drop in the last quarter down to 21% um, responded to within an adequate Time frame. I noticed that there, there was supposed to be someone put onto that and into a role specifically addressing communication around RFSs. Has someone been put in that role or not? What, what's some rationale behind that? So through the chair, we have had somebody employed in that role. So somebody is there. There's a lot that have been handed between contractors for us to now resolve. So they've come back on the books for us to take over because we've pulled them back off down. So we've had a large lump of outstanding ones that have been sitting that have now traditionally been off our RFS book have come back onto us just to get them sorted out so we can resolve them. Can I just ask what are the repercussions for Downer with having had what were clearly a large number of RFSs sitting there that were not being responded to? It's a performance component for them that we've been working through at the contract board with them and there are implications for them. Thank you. Brown. Oh, so just in regards to the journey, so I just wanted to ask, um, and I appreciate this as a political uh, discussion often, rail, do we not, we, we, we have a resolution, we support it, etc., but we don't seem to, like it doesn't feature in any framework of being, and there's been a lot of media attention of recent um, discussions as to that. So I just wanted, does it, do, it just sits as an outlier because it's not our own, um, but I just, I'm always, when I see journeys, when I know I'm a part of a group who are working hard to get it reinstated. But what's our actual role? Just clarify that for me as a council when it, with regard to that infrastructure currently. And through your worship, if it's an advocacy role, you do not own an oh. asset. It's a, and it's a and if I can update asset. you on the advocacy role, uh, we had a Zoom meeting with Minister Jones on Wednesday. Uh, talking about, oh yes, our recovery plan and, and stuff like that. But anyway, before the Zoom meeting started, um, Councillor Akwaita Brown, you will be very happy to know that Minister Jones said to me, um, he wants, he's inviting himself to the mayoral office to come and talk to us about the rail. So he said in the next few months, he would like to come and to chat to us. So he did raise that and we did, um, yeah, so. That's where our role is, the advocacy role um, on behalf of our community, even though it is not our asset or our money to spend 
Councillor, are you finished, Councillor Gott Brown, Councillor Robinson, and then Councillor Burdett? Um, Mr. Wilson, the extra metal um, that was discussed before, is that sourced locally or does that come into the region? Uh, through the chair, all of those come from local quarries. So they're, they're all from within local quarries here inside Afferty. Who put their hand up and I said their name and now I forgot? Uncle Bill. Uncle Bill. Councillor Burdett. Change, <coughs> Microphone. Second one from the bottom. Decisions have been made on the wire with the landfill closing. No decision made on the option to close the landfill and work continues to wipe the landfill advisory group to look at alternative options and feasibility of having a landfill or not. Now, this group have never met. They've only just been appointed after a number of years, and that is not what their role is. Their role is to advise on the well-being of the landfill and the operations. So that's not correct. We're not talking about closing. Before we even do that, that's five years away, <coughs> we have to go back to our wider community. That's the commitment this council gave. Mr. White, do you want you to comment on that? Uh, through your worship, I'm just looking for the uh, the section in here. Oh, second to bottom. No decision has been made on the option to close the landfill. Uh, and Council continues to work with the YP Landfill Advisory Group to look at alternative options. Uh, so that group has a statutory role under the consent, uh, and that has uh, several meetings that have been held over the last year. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Faulkner. Um, yeah. um, rural transfer stations, where are they? Okay. In the township, so they're township transfer stations, not rural ones. <laughs> no, it's just that there was a request made during uh, lockdown uh, from our rural communities that uh, they look at the potential for um, recycling options within rural communities, not township communities, but within rural communities, and um, just wanted to table that in the interest of perhaps getting their looked at. Thank you. Councillors, we move on to our livable communities, which include cultural activities and recreation and amenity. That's page 218 up to page 23. Any questions or queries or not? No. Councillor Foster. Absolutely, I've just got a couple actually. Um, on page 220, uh, just the status of Hawaii, Tolana, and the uh, uh, um statues. What, what's, um, are they still on track to be done before the end of the year? Or we're looking with our asbestos. <laughs> <laughs> so we're working through the remediation plan with um, Iwi around that. So in the meantime, just trying to keep that site. We've got a bit um, unruly over the lockdown period, so just trying to keep that site nice yeah. and presentable until we're able yeah. to firm up the cost and the approach that we're going to take. Right, exactly. Looks like it could be something by the end of the year, possibly. <laughs> Okay, um, the other, I've got another one too on, on page 230. Uh, the the um Summit Project, I know the government funding has been um, taken away, but does that mean the project is defunct or are we still going to keep it on our books and look at potential um, other funders for it? Because, you know, for me, I think it's a huge strategic asset for tourism, particularly New Zealand tourism. Um, it would really um, enhance that whole area. And, and he's through your worship so what what um does allow us to do um is that we've been able to retain almost a million dollars to 
to um, get the project fully scoped and detailed designs done in value engineering. So that buys us some time um, to continue with that crucial piece of work. And, and that, that takes the longest part, I think. So um, by that, we're hoping that um, we initially put up an alternative where we could try and accelerate the project. Um, that by October we might be shovel ready if we've been able to agree to a detailed design and then we would go back and hopefully there might be another round of this type of funding available um, for this project. So that's the intention is we have enough funding to get detailed design and shovel ready um, and then, then we would have to go for external grant funding. It's so stretched it was banging people on the head. Um, but is it going to be reinstated sometime soon? Mr. White. Uh, correctly, it was stolen. It was stolen yeah. And I think that's probably the third time that it's been stolen. Um, but we'll continue to replace um, that and put more uh, security around holding it in place, I imagine. Councillor Robinson. Okay, people. Councillor Robinson has got the floor. Can someone just confirm that the soil in which the asbestos levels have been found at the site, as Councillor Foster referred to, are those soils secure? Because I, I do walk past that site and it seems to be turned open and open, and um, we're not at risk of having opened up a public health risk, is it, is it sealed over again or is it safe? Mr. White. Uh, Your Worship, I, uh, uh, we uh, undertook temporary works on the, I think it's the three uh, sample sites where asbestos was found to cover that, but we need to do a long-term remediation uh, of that site. So the answer is no, the temporary work has been done to make those uh, particular bores safe and uh, but there will be further work required. Thank you for that. Councillors, any more questions? Councillor Watermark. Yeah, I just had a question around the Nelson Park playground. If we don't have the funds to replace that playground, is, is it possible for us to um, make minor changes to it that would make it safe? It seems a bit mean in the current environment to take away a playground that is probably being enjoyed and not replace it. Uh, are, there, are there other options that we have looked at? Mr White. Um, now this is the last example of the old Timber Lions playgrounds that have been in place for 30 or 40 years so they were wonderful uh, in their time and for many years afterwards. But actually the design spec uh, doesn't meet current safety standards and the uh, corrosion and rot uh, is also an issue as well. So we're actually at the point with the age of these things that there isn't really any maintenance work that continued, can continue to be done with this. So our issue fundamentally, which is, which is we have been working through with our play, playground renewal program over the last five years is that our, our funding availability for renewal for playgrounds this time round is just not sufficient to do this one. Thank you for that. We're going to move on to performance and planning and that is uh, in, includes customer engagement and strategic planning and performance that is page 234. Councillor Gregory. Thank you. Um, I just have a question on page 236 with uh, talking about um, a project to be initiated to revitalise Sinai at the entrances and exits. I don't know anything about it. Maybe it's something that's been talked about before, but tomorrow we're going to be talking about um, the Endeavour replicas at the operation scene. I just wondered if that might be useful information to know about before we get, head into that. Page 236, watch, watch box. 
Um, to page, oh, sorry, it's 237. Sorry. <laughs> We're all looking at 237. Um, ensure all non-icon signage is bilingual and revitalise the entrance and exits to Gisborne to Tarapiti. So I just wondered, I haven't heard anything about this, um, and so maybe it's been spoken about before, but what is that? project to revitalise signage and I just was thinking that tomorrow we're going to be at the operations talking about those Endeavour replicas um, and I just wondered if there's anything there that you could tell us that might help. Yeah. So um, for your worship, that's with regard to our um, signage that we have, have up in our parks and open spaces or any um, kind of written signage that it would all be, the council had in place a policy that that it would have signage would be quite bilingual. Yeah. So it was a process of changing those out where they needed updated. Yeah. But, and it, also, sorry, it also says the project will be initiated in the 2021 to revitalise signage at our entrances and exits. So there's so signage, not um, models? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. That in that, in that instance, that, 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 so it's not a uh, public art piece, for example. Yeah, yeah. That, that's just yeah, a sign welcome to Gisborne or whatever that might be. Brown. Just following on from signage speak, um, the signage that uh, NZTA put up, or you know, in regards to um, uh, what are they called when they do a, a message, safety, you know, safety, safety stuff. stuff. Um, are those bilingual um, or their spaces? I've just had someone that, that mentioned that there was a sign on Wainui Road that wasn't bilingual, was just in Penel. No, I just wanted, is it across all spheres that we do bilingual or sometimes there is a, a space to promote the uh, Māori Language Week or some more language week, etc. So I was just wondering. Um, yeah, so through the through the chair, it's um, council on its local road can do bilingual signage. Um, the, I know Dave and the team struggle with NZTA around bilingual signage on the state highway. They have rules that they need to apply and um, bilingual signage isn't part of their current suite of rules. Okay, councillors, if there are no more questions, we move to our next section, which is governance and support, and that is governance and democracy that starts on 246 and support services as well. Councillor Robinson. That is true. Let's go back, two, three, four. Thank you, councillors at the back. I'm just testing to see if everyone is still away. <laughs> 234, we are at customer engagement. Any questions around those um, planning and performance issues? So that is strategic planning and performance and customer engagement. Councillor Burdett. You will have to speak up and use your microphone, both. Management, including a catchment plan for the water. Can I ask, please, are we doing the plan? Are we doing it in consultation with Night Pro? <coughs> or are they doing the plan? Um, for your worship, we're doing it under a joint management agreement with um, Ngāti Parai, so it's a co-creation of a plan. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now that I know everyone's awake, we'll be moving on to the next section. There are two, Councillor Dunn is yawning, so I'm not sure about the back bench. We are now on page 246, and we are covering governance and democracy, as well as support services. Councillor Robinson, did I see your hand? You did, ma'am. Um, page 248, um, three points I would like to address. The first is motion to the local leadership body. Um, so the progress update uh, doesn't really provide a lot of direction as to what's happening with the LLB. Um, can we please have an update as to that stored? Yes, we understand that. Um, is it still stored? Are we still waiting for one particular iwi to progress matters? Is there any progress in this area at all? That's one of my three. 
Let's call her or CEO. Respond to that. Um, so through your worships, um, yeah, we are, we can only go as fast as we are ready to. And part of that was around um, when the Mahaki settlement had been resolved and they had notified the minister in terms of process, they need to notify the minister that they're ready to enact the LLB and then we will get notification. So it is not with us to commence that. It is, is really with we to decide when they are ready. Thank you. My second question was in relation to two boxes down the representation review. It says a report is currently being prepared for council to consider whether to revisit their representation arrangements in 2021, da, 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 da. Um, can you please forward to us the terms of reference or the brief for that report? And, and also, um, does it address, include the issue of Māori representation, impacts on Māori representation uh, in local democracy in that report? Those are my two questions in relation to that part. Thank um, you. So through your worship, what we can send you is the last representation recommendation, uh, representation review recommendation, which essentially the local government commission overruled which um, was a council which was voted for at large with nine elected members from memory. Um, so we can provide that. And it was because of that was a preferred uh, or the recommended approach that the council had at that time. Uh, the discussion was whether that, that model came back uh, for review. So we can provide that. We don't have like a terms of reference for this. this Last so, oh, sorry. So, so when it says a report is being currently being prepared, so by whom, on what, with what sorry. guidance, why are they preparing a report? Yeah, I can speak to that. So the, the last council deferred the matter of whether we should consider an early representation review, and they deferred that matter to the new council, which is you guys, um, to decide on whether you want to do it in a, before, three, like in a three yearly cycle rather than the statutory six yearly cycle. So that'll be a big part of the focus of the report is for this council to consider whether you want to do an early representation review. And then my third question, Madam Chair, was in relation to the next box down, which was, says council ran a fair and legal transparent election with a slightly increased voter turnout. Can we please have an update on uh, Māori turnout, Māori participation uh, in the last election and some thoughts, please, from the teams on how we can increase that and, and that can possibly be incorporated in our LTP annual plan, et cetera. Is that information available, Mr Beatty? It's all easily available when people vote, do we know the ethnicity? No, not necessarily. I mean, the only way I, I understand that you can get it is for those that are on the Māori roll. So that's the closest. So I don't know that it will actually give us enough information in terms of Māori people who sit on the general roll. Uh, that's been my experience, unless you've got something to add to that, Heather. Yeah. Yeah, so the data is aggregated on general role, Māori role. Um, the law requires that you're a Māori to be on the Māori role. What it won't cover and what we cannot distinguish is people sitting on the general role who might happen to be Māori who voted. Right. Well, I do know from having been on the voter participation project uh, three elections ago, it is possible to get the information um, from DIA, but um, obviously it's not something that's readily accessible. It is quite high high level information to get it. Thank you for your questions. I think I might need some more coffee because I can't remember who was next. Uh, was was Councillor Farihinga? Yes, yes, you go next. I, yeah. It, and it was only just to make a comment in regards to the LLB. I just did want to um, let us know that Tamanu Hiri have just recently appoint, um, appointed Doug mm. Jones as a new mm. CEO. And um, the LLB was part of the Tamanuhiri Treaty Settlement. So I'm imagining with the appointment of a new CE that that would end up coming back onto their work program and, and moving that forward. And that, that's, that's what I'm really, really hopeful for. Okay, councillors, we move to our last section. Yes, councillor Wardsnock. Uh, I just note that on page 242, um, talking about the, um, uh, the staff are gathering um, existing plan, you know, which, which 
between provisions need to be altered, et cetera, et cetera, doing a bit of work into, um, into that area. Have we allocated any budget for that? In, um, to, to what extent? I couldn't immediately pick it out of our, our financials. Uh, and sorry, just I'm going to give you the other one here too. Um, the other question was around the Manutuki um, Township Plan. So the plan is completed. Is there a timeline around the implementation of the plan? Um, I might get uh, Kate, uh, Ms. Kohere Ms. Kohere. to um, respond to the question around the budget allocated for the, the Tairawhiti Resource Management Plan review, and then the Manutuki. You might have to repeat the Manutuki question because I was concentrating on the budget. Um, so, um, yes, there is budget allocated. It's um, termed uh, plans and strategy. So it, it's captured as a, as a whole. So it's not a specific line item. Um, and in terms of that work program, you've got a paper coming to sustainable tight on the work. Yeah. Just um, for uh, I know that the, the plan is nearing completion. Uh, is there an implementation time frame? Um, we did have a time frame. Uh, we met with them just prior to COVID, uh, but I suspect that that's been put on hold a bit. Um, I'll, I'll check for you to ask what the reply is. Oh, great. Great. Thank you. Any more questions? Otherwise, we move to our, uh, another question. Councillor Seymour. We're moving to our operation, our commercial operations. Yes. My question is about 257, and the, it relates to the performance measures, and I guess it's from our questionnaires, and the response is quite poor from our community. So I just want to know what strategy council officers are developing up to improve that, because at 35, 38, and 45% satisfaction when the target's 65, is there some work being done? Is there something going to be done through the LTP or the annual plan? What is the management's intention about improving that, please? And I have another question in the same section. Who will be answering that? Good um, <laughs> that's a tricky one. So when they, um, when Key Research run the uh, interviews, so they do a selection of, I think it's about was it 100 people. Um, per quarter to try and get a measure around where um, our residents are satisfied. And some of that metrics pulled out from performance and all the other activities. So there might be key things around how well do you think we've spent the money. Um, so they're like those critical success factors and then that kind of all bubbles up into what this looks like. It's a tricky one. I think um, there that it's, it's an issue around um, firstly are they aware of what the rates are being spent on and whether they agree that that's a good spend of money. For example, we saw in um, still comments coming through around council should stick to the basics and there's not a lot of not basics that we don't do here. So I think there's, a, there's an issue around whether the public really understand how the rates are spent and then secondly, whether they see that rate being spent is value for money. So mm. it's, it is a difficult one and it's on all of us in terms of meeting our, the theory is if we can, meet those metrics that are put forward in our levels of service that you saw in those in the quarterly reports that hopefully overall we'll be lifting um, that, that view. Uh, and how if, supplementary, can I just ask, is it only a hundred people that ask? Because we actually got fined the other day, but there was no one in the household that fit in. And I know it's not this one, but it'll be the next one. So what size pool of people are they asking? Because if it's a small pool of a hundred. Well, that's not very many, is it? So, we'll... That has always been my concern. It is ridiculous. Sorry, I didn't see the 91. I've been harping on about yeah, this yep, before. Yep. Well, that isn't a lot. So is that the number that are being um, interviewed at the moment? Right. So do we need to tweak the question? Yes, we have asked um, Key Research, who's our um, provider, to look at alternative ways so that we're not just relying on landlines and we're getting a really good spread because they yes. also had to wait on ethnicity. Uh, we weren't getting enough on um, balance there to reflect the region and age. Um, so, you know, when you start tinkering around with different variables and waiting, you're not 
getting yep. a proper sample. So that has been tasked with the team to go away and work with peer research to be able to get the better methodology that we can use to get mm. accurate, well, a better gu guide for us around where we need to target our interventions. Yeah, thank you. Madam Chair, I just had one further question which relates to forestry on page 260. And I don't, um, it says that updates will be given to finance and performance for May 20, which is today, over implementation plans and how it will align for future years. So I think there must be a report that we are about to get on that because we don't have that today. This is not a, just about palm oil. I take it it's all our interest in forestry. So it says investigate replanting and partnering. And GHL leases. Um, so this is the palm oil we got today. Council seen all the implementation plans and how it will align. Right. Okay. Well, it doesn't say that expressly. Um, so I thought that we do have some other interest in forestry, and I thought it might have been about all of that, but it's not. Great. Thank you, councillors. Any more questions on this big fat report? The floor is now open. If you have any other questions, otherwise, I'm going to take you to page 143 and I want to thank staff. Thank you for this. Um, it gives us a good idea of where we need to sharpen up, what we need to do differently, and um, it gives us a good idea how we're tracking. So thank you for, for that. It's a very thorough update for all of us what happened in the last three months. I will move the report on page 143, seconded by Councillor Burkett. If there are no more questions, all in favour, aye. Uh, contrary, carry. Grab a coffee if you want to stretch your legs for two minutes and we'll move on to our harbour. Um, just a two, three minute break and then we'll move on to our last year of days. Andy, Andy, I sent you an email. Yeah.
Can I please just open the paper and then we discuss what is going on here. Staff, we are on page 262. Who is the staff member who we can ask some process questions around this? Well, our CEO. So, we had a, we had a paper given to us. Councillor Dum. We had, a, we had a paper submitted to us at our last meeting in regards to funding that would be allocated towards buying a boat. Um, if I vaguely remember, it was 200K, but we ask for more information. If someone can just get the specific wording of that resolution to me. Yes, so we ask for the operating cost. So I'm just going to open up and then Councillor Dowsing had a question and then we will move from there. Yep, so um, just in terms of the uh, minutes on your agenda, page nine outlined what the recommendation was, which was that Council approves funding up to 200k for the purchase of the Harbour Master Boat subject to the subject to the acceptance of detailed operational costs. So what you've got is the detail of those operational costs and if there were to be a recommendation in there, it would be accept the detailed operational costs. So I um, would, Councillor Dowsing, are you happy, do you raise an issue? Okay, so Councillor Seymour, thank you, I've got a mover here, to receive, note the contents, but you are happy for the wording that's accept the, yep. So we've got the number two is accepts the information around operating cost. Seconded by Councillor Faulkner. Councillor Dowsing, you wanted to say something in regards to this paper. Now is your time. Thank you. Um, uh, I remember how we came to the. Uh, I remember how we came to the resolution at the last one. It wasn't exactly the clearest process, and I thought the um, the minutes that were uh, particularly in relation to this piece were somewhat wanting. Um, when you look at the minutes, there's a there's a um, review of the report, and then two sentences based on our one hour discussion. Um, it didn't really capture the the heart of the discussion, and that was um, not just the operating expenses, but the, the necessity for the operation at all. Um, when I uh, when I went into more depth on this and looked at what um, our requirement is with Maritime New Zealand, and the uh, and specifically what our obligations are, um, it hasn't been captured in uh, either of the reports. And it's that our obligations uh, around uh, having enforcement and enforcement policy. And we have no enforcement policy. Um, it is, uh, and by purchasing a boat, we are preempting policy. We're just buying an enforcement mechanism and still don't have an enforcement policy. Uh, the, uh, there's also quite a lot to note around what the, uh, about who applies that enforcement. So we can have a harbour master, we can have enforcement officials, and we can have, um, and we can assign uh, external officials also. So we could have Māori wardens, for example, doing enforcement in this area. Um, and when I and when I read the report around the around what the intentions are for this boat to do, it is to drive from boat to boat and check that people have. Enough, uh, enough life jackets during the summer period. Now, to be clear on what the responsibility of the harbour master is, it is to, or our enforcement is, it is to ensure that boats are not used without the correct amount of life jackets. Not to go to the water and see if they've got them, to stop them before it is used if they don't have enough life jackets. That is, that is done at the, at the ramp, not done in the ocean. Um, when we come back around full circle and we start deciding to buy a boat to, to chase around the ocean, um, potential problems, we forget that actually the largest problem that our harbour master should be dealing with currently is the swimming in the inner harbour. And we are not enforcing that bylaw. Now that is again something that you offer, something that needs to be done from the wharf. So I don't believe at the moment we have enough policy to support the purchase of a boat or these operating costs. I don't think we have 
uh, I think we need to establish that before we make determinations on expenditure. Um, I think we need to address what our biggest risks are, and it's certainly not people going over five knots in the inner harbour and having to chase them down with a harbour master boat. Um, I think it's a, I think it's a very poor use of council money to be purchasing a boat and to be spending it on these operating costs. Uh, so I won't support the recommendation. Councillors, thank you for that, Councillor Dowsing. I have Councillor Foster next. Yeah, I'd just like to support actually, um, Councillor Dowsing on that. Um, I've spoken to a lot of people involved with the boating community, the fishing club, the yachting club, and I have had no, not one person actually support the cause for a harbour master to have a boat. In fact, most of them have been saying it's a total waste of um, 200k because of they know themselves of what the um, harbour master's roles and everything should be. So yeah, I totally support um, Councillor Dowsing on this and I would really recommend that we look seriously at the actual purchase of this boat and whether we need one or not. Um, I might just quickly clarify that what we're discussing today, we are not re-litigating the whole issue. Um, and I might be wrong, and I'm happy to be said that I'm wrong, but my understanding is that today we are looking at this paper, talking about the um, additional information we ask for. So maybe I'll just hand over to the CEO just to clarify, because it's not like I want to stop debate. I just want to make sure we focus on the issue that we are tasked with Days. So I'll just I'll hand it over to you. Yes, yeah, so just in terms of your worship, um, the paper is about the operational costs. The council resolved uh, that we would purchase a boat subject to accepting the operational costs. So that is the discussion that should be had rather than the role of the harbour master and its functions or otherwise. And I suggest that given the discussion, that council might warrant from having a session on the roles and responsibility of a harbour master and therefore your accountability as well as a regional council with that function. Councillor Shelbrag. Thank you. Um, so within these costs, I see Otago, Waikato Bay of Plenty. What I don't see is any cost for a second person on this vessel if it's going to operate. It's just taking carte blanche that the hard mass is going to launch, pull this boat out, operate it, pop out, check the cray pots, people stealing them, and, um, and he's going to be on his own. And he's potentially just going to be on his own. So I thought part of the costing would be a secondary person simply around health and safety. And I absolutely concur that the jumping in at the at the ramp is a serious issue. In fact, I've almost had a kid as I went under the bridge jump into my boat. Thank you for that, Councillor Shelbrake. Councillor, yes, um, yes, yes, yes. Sorry, Your Worship. Just responding in, ter in terms of the second person at the last discussion that we had in February, Sunny clarified that he was not a second person was not required to manage this. Yeah, I would, I'd seriously debate that. Councillor Cranston. Yeah, I was just going to answer that as well. I was quite clearly understood when Mr. Ali was here. He indicated that he was well, well within his ability to operate it as a single, single unit. And my understanding was that this is just an owner report, and it's about the operating costs. Thank you, Councillor Gregory, and then Councillor Warsnop. Ask a question. It says in the. Uh, um, as there was a harbour master up until 2013. Well, so did we have a harbour master up until 2013 with a boat or just a harbour master? Yeah. We've never had one, a harbour master or a boat. Yeah. So, but up until 2013, someone was doing it. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, so, through your worship, one of the things that was mentioned before was that up until 2013, the council were not meeting their responsibilities yes. under the Maritime Act, and we were subsequently criticised for that with the JDF Millennium. Councillor Dunn. Um, 
The, just some clarity on this. So we've made a previous decision, but it was dependent on receiving this information. If we're not happy with this information, when do we go back and revisit that decision? Is it at council? Or are we not going back to revisit it because we've had some concerns raised? How are we then to address them to relook at the original decision? Okay. So, um, so I, I think the the resolve here is whether or not you accept the operational costs. So, if you can get to that point, then we work out whether we need to the process in terms of going back and revisiting that decision. So if, there's clear, if, there, if there is concern around the operational costs that are presented here, and I've not yet heard anything to suggest that there's concerns around the operational costs, I'm, what I'm hearing is concerns about our role as a um, and function in terms of half the master, which wasn't um, the condition that that um, approval was given for. Um, so what it sounds like, or what it, we might end up is actually needing to revoke that last decision, which would be another council meeting. So, to that, that's not how I understood the process. I thought that we were making a decision, but it was subsequent to getting adequate follow on information. So, we may have found ourselves in a position here where we've then got additional information, but then want to go and revisit that. Because we can't really say that we really did accept that decision because we were waiting for further information. So it's hard, I can't separate out these things because they're all kind of connected. The yeah, so um, you sorry for the, the confusion. The, the minute's clear. The minute is that you've accept, approved it subject to, subject to receiving the operational cost. So that's, that's the minute. Okay, so what I read here today is that we had a paper presented to us which we accepted by saying we accept it, but can we please get some additional information? Today we have received that additional information. We don't really find fault with the additional information, but what I'm picking up is that there are some people that want to relitigate the original decision. We've got clear processes. If you want to relitigate something, you get five of your colleagues to sign within a certain date and time, which I can't remember now, and we can then go and revisit. We've all done that before. So um, that is the process that I understand and, and how we go about. What Councillor Dunn has raised um, is, so, so is that the correct process that I have got in my head? Councillor Dowsey. I was just going to challenge that. It's that if we don't approve the operational costs today, then we do not buy a boat because it is subject to approval. If we approve it today, we buy a boat. I am challenging the. I, 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 we haven't made a decision. We've made a. This. No, we made a decision pending approval. Today we are making the approval. We made a decision to buy the boat subject to further information yep. on operating costs. Subject to charges, costs, nothing more. Sorry, and, and my argument today is that I've received the operating expenditure. I don't accept the necessity for that operating expenditure. Okay, people, we have got... Okay, okay, okay. Can everyone just relax and put their hands down? So, so that's why I'm happy to move the day for my salary committee, but I'm very happy to work on the borderline movement of it, and if it means that we get a vote of the so I'll move that we decline the uh, the operating expenditure. 
Councillor Warsnall. <laughs> So the question I want to know, because this mayor, the, our Harbour Master is quite clearly the difference between us meeting or not meeting our legislative requirements. What, in your view, um, through the chair, is the likelihood of us keeping our Harbour Master in the absence of a vote? Um, for your worship, I would, um, I mean, it's very, it's difficult to say. I can't um, imagine what um, our Harbour Master is. Feeling, but I point, do know point of order, we shouldn't be discussing individual contracts. I'm not discussing. No, 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 I, I, not for your Can I please chair the meeting? Yeah. Thank you. It's a risk. It is a risk. And I did highlight that, and I think he's been very clear about he is the only harbour master in New Zealand without a vote. Okay, so can I please ex receive advice now from the CEO? We now have a paper, page 262. Um, any other people that have not spoken before? Councillor Faulkner, Councillor Farahinga, Councillor Robinson. Go. Uh, well, I've got to uh, around the fact that we do run the risk of not meeting our obligations without a harbour master and equally without that harbour master being mobile <coughs> on the water. Um, I, I dispute the fact that we've never heard about this because I distinctly recall that we had an induction uh, discussion around all of this and it outlined our statutory requirements. Um, I also dispute the fact that we didn't all agree, um, or, or sorry, that we didn't pass the agreement the, the last time we spoke about this because we did. So just to keep things really simple, yes, we've heard about it lots. Yes, we have statutory requirements. And yes, we agreed last time round, pending this paper, to put our harbour master on the water. Thank you. We move on to Councillor Farahinga. Uh, thank you very much, Your Worship. Um, yeah, I'm supportive of the um, of the recommendation that has been put on the table. That's been um, moved and seconded. Um, I, I do note that some was um, that the mover was unmoving and if the seconder was willing to move I'd be willing to second um, yeah uh, because I too am in the same boat we've had this conversation we had a robust discussion about it um, and, and people that have been bringing up the, the, there are definitely issues in regards to jumpers but that has nothing to do with the operational cost of this boat that is a separate issue that I, I um, that we do need to have a discussion about we have had discussions about this um, so we do need to address that, but I think that that's outside of the, the operational expenditure of, of this boat. I distinctly remember my um, issue being around our first discussion, you know, what are we agreeing to here? Are we agreeing to buy in a boat that's then going to cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars? And then I look like an irresponsible councillor for saying yes to something that's going to have um, huge cost blowouts for us. This has come back saying eight to 9,000 and I'm comfortable with that operating um, uh, with that operating costs, because like um, as has been alluded, I don't know if um, we captured that or what was on the record, but like what was said, it's a figure that I can then hold the harbour master and our council organisation to account over. I move on to Councillor Robinson. Thank you. I wasn't part of the discussion back in February. <clears throat> I was in Auckland at a concert, um, but. Looking, applying my legal brain to what was uh, the recommendation of the council, clearly the purchasing of the boat was subject to acceptance of a detailed operations cost. So if this report today was not accepted, then the purchase would not be approved because it was subject to that. So that's, that's the legal status, put that aside. I do have some, as a, as a long-term life boater, I do have some concerns about, our health and safety concerns about Harbour Master single-handedly launching a 6.5 metre boat in that particular boat ramp, being able to safely handle it, storing it, towing it, does he get a free car to tow it? Where does he park it? Because we can't find a bloody park down there when it's a fishing compound. There's a whole lot of issues around it. But anyway, that's by the by. I, didn't, I wasn't here, I was enjoying a concert, I didn't participate in that court at all. Um, but, but yeah, so if we do approve this, if we do approve this report, then we do approve the purchase. Okay, anyone else? Councillor Dunn. Yes, um, I would like to hear the um, Chief Executive's view on what Councillor Dowsing said about the lack of policy. Um, can you give us your view, the organisation's view on that please? Because if it is missing, then we probably should address it. 
So, um, uh, yeah, there's not two ways you can go about that. You can either um, who you worship in terms of the navigational safety bylaw. Um, it runs a risk of then you need to have more enforcement out there. Um, so I'd need to have a look in, um, at what we're missing by way of additional policy that we would need. But it's not just the navigational bylaw that the harbour master is responsible for. Um, there's also things such as um, making sure navigational aids and markers such as our buoys, beacons, lights along the coast are operating fine, that we're removing navigational hazards, any um, large logs or driftwood or anything like that is all part of the scope. So it doesn't just rely on a navigational bylaw for the harbour master to enact duties that are required out onto the water. No, you're not. No, you're not. But you may need to be out there as a harbour master providing some assistance to those vessels that may be able to do that. So what are the other policies? Primarily an update around the navigational safety bylaws, what I'm is referring to. So it just depends on the gaps that are identified in there. But we do have, so the, under the Maritime Safety Act, we get audited on our um, compliance with that. And so... Last year was the first time, and I think I did um, advise council that we have been fully compliant and meeting the requirements under that safety bylaw, I mean, under the Maritime um, Health and Safety Act. So what we can do um, is provide some further information to council, because clearly there's some information gaps that need to be met here, um, and also give you an overview around our um, the current what's currently in place and identify if there are any policy gaps. So are you suggesting that No. No. What are you that was not the question. The question was whether there were any policy gaps. Is that right? Well, yeah, what I was meaning is that Councillor Dowsing has put doubt in my mind about whether this is necessary and I was wanting your response to say should what are the policies and are we covering them and therefore? Okay, sorry. So um, what I was saying was that it, you don't, it's not the absence of the policy that you need for, in order to have the boat. It's the function of the harbour master that has a whole heap of other requirements that also necessitates him to have a fundamental tool for his job, to do his job. That is the other part. Policy discussion is something different. We can have a look at that and have a conversation around what other policies do we need or do we need to amend our navigational bylaw. But that's different from the need to have a boat. Okay, councillors. Councillor Foster. Yeah, just, just one other comment on that. Um, we're now into pro-COVID-19 um, arena and um, you know, we're going to be facing some huge costs um, and some decisions in the future that are going to be um, really important about our funding ability for the future. So you know, we, we are having to, we're going to have to be pretty ruthless with some of our spending. And um, this, way, this may be the first one um, if the um, criteria we get um, given doesn't meet up to it. So I'm just putting that out there that um, you know, we're in a new phase at the moment and I don't think it's going to get any better. And I think most of us realise we're going to have to make some harsh decisions. So. Councillor Cranston. Yeah, I think a lot of people have forgotten the conversation, how it went. This was clearly identified as a health and safety issue. The person couldn't do his job without, the, without us providing this resource. And I was quite clear that we voted on it because we had to amend that health and safety issue. I don't think it's about going out into the bay and counting life jackets. I think the health and safety aspects of his position are far broader than that. So I'm quite comfortable with the decision we made and I'm quite comfortable where the operational expenses have come in at. Thanks for that, Councillor Cranston. And I have to agree with you. When we had our initial discussion, staff brought to us the information on where we had gaps and how we can address it. We all raised questions that day and I remember saying, we have got a qualified harbour master here who is giving us the information um, he has, is experienced and maybe we should listen to, to the specialist and he knows what he's talking about and I still 
agree he's a, he's a very experienced harbour master. So to me, when this came to our table, it was a gap that our CEO risk for our organisation that is addressed in a certain way. We had a big debate that day and it was good debate and questions raised and questions asked. So when we made that decision on the day, we did say we agree subject to more information. This information is now sitting in this paper. So we are not disagreeing with the information in this paper. We are not saying we don't want to accept this paper. What some people are highlighting is that they might want to go back and relitigate the whole um, issue of if we should buy a boat or not. Am I reading the temperature in this room correct? No, and it is not the subject. So I'm just going to go back to my initial um, observation and then I'll ask staff to just comment on the legality or if we're doing it the right way. My understanding is that if we note this today, the action is in plan to buy a boat. If you want to stop that and relitigate this, you can get five of your colleagues to sign a re revocation, if there's a word like that, and we can then revisit the process. Am I correct? Yes, that's correct so, by way of process. So that is correct by way of process. So to me, I like process. I like to know that we do something right, that down the track, something is not coming to bite us in the butt. So councillors, what I'm gonna do is stick to proper process. There is an option for someone that don't agree with what we are um, decisions made to then go back and revisit that. So for me to be fair and to do my job, I will be following the process as we have followed it up to now. I will allow more, more discussion, but we do need to wrap it up as well because we don't wanna go around and around. I think we all understand what we are talking about here today. So I'm gonna allow a few more comments, but then we will see where we go from there. Councillor Robinson. Madam Chair, you are correct and those are our process options. The, the other option is because the initial decision was subject to accept in this report, if this report was not accepted today, then the initial decision fails. Yes, because that, that's what the wording of the decision on page nine is. I hear what you're saying, yep. Okay. yep. Said, subject to the approval of this report. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, so subject to the approval of detailed operational costs, so it would have to be on that on that basis. Okay, any other discussions? Because what I'm going to do then is, because we don't have a mover in the second, eh? No, but you, you moved and Sandra seconded and then you were through your move. Oh, I missed that. So we've got a mover in Councillor. Okay, councillors, what I'm going to do, yes, absolutely, okay, there's a call for division, so councillors be sharp, when your name is called, we will be voting, so what we are voting on now is, one, note the contents of this report, two, accept the detailed operational um, information um, detailed in this report, okay, Coral and Heather. So you're going to say either yay or nay. Go. Just be clear, please. Yes. Carried. Thank you. We move on to the last public paper for today, the rates and sundry invoice um, debt management up to the 31st of March. Thank you for this report, your department, Mrs. Ms. Foreman. 
I've got a mover in Councillor Dowsing and a seconder in Councillor Meredith Akuata Brown. Any questions? If not, I'm going to put it to the floor. All in favour? Contrary, carried. Um, I do want to thank everyone for their contribution today and uh, thank you. We have asked a number of times for the spreadsheet that is going to indicate, and everybody has heard that request. We don't have it yet. And it was mentioned that it was going to be provided in hard copy to this meeting. So we please don't want to lose sight of it. We've no. had it every other time before the rates, is, um, long before we agree them. And we just need to understand the implications across the district on our properties. Thank, Thank you. you for that, Councillor Seymour. I, I spoke to Ms Foreman about that and the, it will definitely not glide off. We will get it soon. Yes, and the delays is because um, the changes for this uh, statement of attempt um, were the dividends. We had to change the modelling, and that was about the 8th or 9th of May. And then the late changes with the capital expenditure. So I, yesterday was the last day when we actually did the rate modelling. So it is there. We just need to get the, um, the actual part out to you, and that can be sent into an email before you accept the um, annual plan. Thank you. Thank you. We will all get it, yeah. Thank you. We move to page 273, councillors. This is our statute barred rights. No, can I just ask a question about that? Because we normally get a paper that trumps it. All we've got there is a big list of places. It is in public excluded. Right. But so, there's, still done, there's still not a recommendation. You have to add it all up yourself, don't you? Or look to the bottom column. There's no actual recommendation that I could find. So that, um, no, but defined, so therefore there's, it's just for noting. So it happens as a part of a process. If the, the criteria fits, that's what you actually put and submit. And then we gave for the information in public excluded because there's private information um, in that arena. So you had that um, attached. These are not the Whenua Rahui, these are the statute barred. But where, is, it, which where is, is the recommendation in the agenda that actually is the resolution that says council approved the statute barred rates to the value of X, Y, Z. I can't you, find that. So I'm for just... your worship, you, you do not have to have a council resolution. It is by, by law, yeah. these occur because it's um, within the statute timeframes. So it is not a part of the process that you accept these ones. It is just for noting the amount so why, that it occurs. With respect, why isn't there a paper that says we note it? Otherwise, it, it is. Page 273 notes the contents of the report. That's not about statute barred rates, it is. is it? Yes, it is. The, and the, then the information is just in public excluded because there are properties in there that is... Sure, sure. I get that completely, but I couldn't see that it was a separate item covering a substantial chunk. I can see that. It says... Oh, I had a move at Councillor Farihinga and Councillor Dowsing. Any questions? Any more questions? Any more clarity? My apologies, I can not find the page. That's fine. Any clarity questions? Councillor Akwata Brown. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just, I just noted earlier in the um, action sheet, there was talk of a uh, land court, um, Māori land court, uh, personnel being invited to come into the space, and I just, when we talk of Māori land in our region, we know. Oh, my question is, um, does that come into the space? Because I was wanting to ask it earlier in the meeting. So, in regards to the statute bar rates on Māori land, uh, expertise-wise, because I saw it was in our action to have Māori land uh, court people. So my question is asking, in respect to this paper, <laughs> are, those, are those working together as such? Just around Māori land. Um, free worship. Not, not in this particular case, because this is by legislation, and yeah. it takes what it is. The other one is a more fuller um, discussion, which will be in um, uh, August, and then we'll come to that particular um, report, and then we'll discussing then. So not in particular for this one. Can I just ask, in respect then to point of orders, 
How does, so are, are, you, are you bringing that up because I've asked a question you don't see fitting into this? Because that's where I get confused, because I'm, I'm trying to work out how things all marry up. So and that's why it's I don't usually when a question is a asked question. that's not relevant. To yeah, you. So see, to me it is. <laughs> so how do no, I that's all right. That's how we sort each other out and just keep it to the paper that's in front of us. That's well, yeah, well, I just saw Mary leaned and I'm just trying to, put, it's a bigger picture to me in respect to this region. So that's why I was asking. Thank you. That's fine. Um, councillors, I have a mover in Councillor Farahinga, a seconder in Councillor Dowsing, all in favour? Contrary carried. Thank you for that. I do want to thank everyone for their contribution today. We will be moving into public excluded now, where we will be doing our maps. I'll move it. Uh, well, I need to pass the minutes and everything, so. So, do you move into public excluded? Councillor Robinson, seconded by Councillor Dowsing.